the first idea I'll, I'll, I'll address is this concerning the concepts of speciesism. So speciesism is um, a concept that is sometimes used to name discrimination against non-human animals. In fact, I think that's not a right definition of it. Speciesism is any kind of discrimination against someone who doesn't belong to a certain species. So most uh, people are speciesists against non-human animals, but we can also be speciesists when we compare animals, the interests of animals of certain species against the interests of animals of other species. And for whatever reason, we give priority to some of them over the other. Maybe because, I don't know, we find those animals more interesting or, or we like them more, or maybe because their size is larger or, or whatnot. But the main one is this one that claims that, you know, um, human interests count for more, no matter the, the weight that those interests have. So the same suffering, just if by virtue of who is the possessor of that suffering or of that interest, then if that person is, if, or if that individual is a human being, then that suffering, that interest counts for more. So what can be the reasons to justify this? Well, it can't be really mere species membership. I mean, and we can see this very intuitively. And we consider what happens in many films where non-humans are given full moral consideration by everyone. So there may be the reason for this, maybe that uh, only humans possess certain capacities that other non-human animals don't possess, or maybe we have some special relationships with other human beings that we don't have with other animals. So the idea then is that we draw this circle and we just give full moral consideration to those inside the circle who are those who have these capacities or other criteria. This is problematic because, you know, there are non-human animals who also satisfy these criteria, but also because there are many uh, human beings who don't satisfy these criteria, right? Uh, in fact, if we are talking about cognitive capacity, what happens there is that all human beings, at least at the beginning of their lives, lack these complex cognitive capacities, which means that if we wanted to give full moral respect to all human beings, well, we should reject these other criteria. But what happens if we do this is that within that circle, we're going to include all human beings, but also all other sentient animals. This is interesting because what we are talking about here, really, and mind that I'm speaking about full moral consideration, it's not just taking someone into account. It's something deeper. Um, because we may take non-human animals into account, but think, well, but the interests of humans count for more. What this argument uh, is challenging is that very idea as well. What this argument is um, somehow furthering is the idea that it's only the weight of the interest that matters. Now, there may be other considerations here, other ways of, of reaching this conclusion. So for instance, suppose that we um, imagine two possible worlds where we could live, and one would be our world, and another one would be a world exactly like ours, uh, except for a couple of things. Uh, one is that it's upside down, something relevant, just you know, to make it a bit different uh, visually. And the other one is that there are no discrimination related to species, no discrimination of non-human animals in this other world. So what of these two worlds uh, we think it's better? Well, uh, it just so happens that if we ignore our identity and considering also that the vast majority of sentient beings that exist on Earth are non-human animals, if we assess this case uh, honestly, we would for sure choose a world where you know, we are not a species. We are respecting, we are giving full moral uh, consideration to non-human animals. Now, if this is so, then again, we have reasons to reject speciesism. This is called the argument from impartiality. It has different versions. This is just one of them. The idea here is that if we think about something under impartial um, constraints, it, it makes sense to think that the conclusions that we would reach would be also the fairest one, the, the more just ones. And uh, the argument goes, then that means that speciesism needs to be unjust because we wouldn't accept it under impartial um, con uh, conditions. Also, you know, um, the idea that sentience is what matters and that accordingly we should respect all sentient beings equally 
can also be uh, backed by this other consideration, which is that we wouldn't really be um, indifferent to our future if we learn that in the future, we would no uh, longer have the cognitive capacities we now have. So for instance, suppose that um, for whatever reason, we have some condition that in a few years will make us lose the cognitive capacities we currently have. But anyway, we would still be sentient. We would care about what happens, what would happen to us in the future. It seems that um, when we think of this in terms of our capacities, and, and we, we consider how we would want to be considered if we had the capacities that no human animal had, again, we would reject uh, being, um, you know, disconsidered and not respected. The idea here is that it's not really that we are claiming that non-human animals should be respected because they are animals. It's just that they satisfy the criteria for that, that other hypothetical beings also, like for instance, uh, artificial sentience, uh, sentient beings would also satisfy in the same way, which means that the accusation that we may be species is also for caring especially for non-human animals instead of humans uh, wouldn't apply here. Okay, this um, implies that many of the ways in which non-human animals are harmed today by human beings can be rejected as uh, problematic, as instances of speciesism. Maybe one thing that I would mention here is that um, when you speak with people who are a bit familiar with animal exploitation, but really not a lot, Typically, they would say things like, yeah, most people don't get it because they think that uh, when we are talking about animal advocacy, what we are considering is maybe the animals whose harms are, mm, you know, mm, more um, visible socially or that most people oppose, such as those suffered by cats and dogs and others. But it's really in the slaughterhouses and factory farms where and animals are suffering the most and in the highest numbers. And, and this is just wrong. So um, the number of animals in, at least in terrestrial uh, factory farms and, and being killed in slaughterhouses are just a minority. Uh, so the vast majority of vertebrates are those, uh, are aquatic animals killed uh, in commercial fishing or also uh, to a lesser degree in, in fish farms. And these are actually a minority as well, because the vast majority, like more than 90% of the animals that, that uh, humans uh, kill uh, are invertebrates, uh, mainly crustaceans and now also insects. So this really is one of the main challenges uh, here. What's interesting here is that what animal advocates typically think of concerning the misconceptions that people sympathetic to animals have concerning what animal advocacy is about, really is very similar to what happens in the case of invertebrates and vertebrates. So most animal advocates really don't get it when it comes to the what should be the, the main priorities when it comes to defending animals. Okay, and then there are some other considerations here that I would uh, uh, like to mention concerning one point that uh, some people sometimes make that they say, well, you know, it's very difficult to convey the idea that we should respect non-human animals that are being exploited, because what happens is that most people find it very intuitive that it's pretty acceptable to use animals in different ways. Now, what's interesting here is that um, both polls and research in psychology um, that has been uh, done in, in recent uh, years shows that things are a bit more complex than this. So what happens really there is that we have, um, you know, several forms of cognitive dissonance. We want to continue to use non-human animals, but on the other hand, we really oppose uh, harming non-human animals. So for instance, this is a thought experiment in which we can ask people if they would be willing to push this red button, if pushing the red buttons um, would have uh, these two effects. So one is it would cause us some pleasurable experience and two, it would cause many animals to die and to suffer terribly in the process. Now, most people would think that we shouldn't be doing that. And then you present them uh, a further, you know, 
this case, but uh, a bit more elaborated, you say, okay, what if there is something, so pressing this button is something we need to do to, you know, to continue to be healthy, to be alive, but we have the option of pressing either these red buttons or other blue buttons that also cause us some pleasurable sensation, uh, though maybe a bit different, but it doesn't mean that any animal suffers or dies. And most people think, well, we should push the blue button. But of course, the red and the blue button uh, exist in reality, right? They just represent our attitudes towards the use of non-human animals for food or for other purposes. Uh, well, animal suffering is a relatively new topic and many people are really unfamiliar with it. So I think that the best starting point to address it is very simple. It's just starting with cases in which humans are helping animals. And there are many, many ways in which this happens. So there are many uh, animals. They may be animals living out there in the wild, maybe in national parks or whatever, but they may also be wild animals living very close uh, to where we are. So they may be wild animals living in, 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 in towns or villages, urban animals or, or animals living in agricultural areas. And there are many cases, I mean, and you may know someone who has helped one of these animals at a certain point, or you may maybe read in the media uh, news of this happening. Um, there are also places like wild animals hospitals or, or you know, centers where sick, injured, or orphan animals are, are, are helped. Um, there are many different examples of what these uh, centers can do all around the world. Um, there are other initiatives, like for instance, um, building artificial shelters or, or, or artific artificial homes for, for, for wild animals. You can see this wombat here, and you know, uh, these animals may have a hard time if they have no places where, where they can hide. And, you know, again, this is an intervention that is done all around the world with different animals. In addition, there are other initiatives, like, for instance, contraception programs that can be implemented when, for instance, humans want to kill certain animals. And an alternative is presented, well, instead of killing them, maybe contraception could work better. This could, for instance, be considered in the case of New York, where you guys are, uh, with rodents. And there are people who are doing research, actually, on, on contraception on, on rodents. And this is also useful for, for these animals, because this allows us to help them better. For instance, suppose that there is a certain population of, of animals, and these animals are starving. And we could help them by providing them uh, supplemental uh, feeding. But what happens then is that if we provide them this food, we may involuntarily um, help this population of animals also to reproduce in higher numbers. And what happens then is that in the future, maybe next year, um, these animals will face the same problem, but maybe at that point it's much bigger because the population has grown. So there is one solution here. We can help them, we can provide them with, with food, but then we can administer them, maybe in the food, uh, these contraceptives. In this way, we are helping them, we are, you know, saving their lives, but we are preventing the problem from growing in the future. Then another, um, and this may be one of the best examples of um, ways of helping wild animals, um, it's really not one that is done for the sake of helping wild animals, but uh, indirectly has this um, very beneficial effect, and it's wild animal vaccination programs. So what you see there, these types of, of biscuits or, or baits, and they are actually baits that have a smell and a taste that animals like, and it has um, it has a, a vaccine. Each of these, these have uh, individual doses of a vaccine against rabies, and they may be distributed from the air. You can see this, this picture of this helicopter in, in Texas that is about to, to do this. And in this way, um, huge numbers of animals can be saved from, from dying a very painful death. And um, this is something that we've been doing some research about. So Animal Ethics, the organization I work with, a couple of years ago, we published this report. And it was a survey where we asked uh, students in natural sciences, but also scientists and scholars 
about different ways of helping animals and about their attitudes towards them. And what we found there is that they strongly supported these measures. So for instance, here in this slide, you can see the results for scholars and you can see how many of them supported um, wild animal vaccination programs, also programs aiming at helping uh, wild animals in urban ecosystems, and also um, the same the, uh, efforts or, or initiatives uh, targeting animals that are harmed by extreme weather events or by natural disasters. They also agreed significantly with, with um, researching uh, these uh, ways of helping wild animals, and eventually this would lead to being uh, with us being able to to implement these measures. So uh, all this is very important because uh, against what many people think, because many people have a rosy view of nature, wild animals unfortunately uh, suffer very significantly in the wild, both for anthropogenic but also for natural reasons. So they may suffer and die due to extreme weather events, as I say disease, uh, parasitism, um, also like things like starvation, or lack of uh, water. Uh, sometimes they may suffer actually for reasons that wouldn't cause us to suffer. For instance, variations in the salinity or the light of their environment that may affect uh, certain populations of, our, of, of animals very significantly. And this doesn't happen also to, only to a minority of animals. So in this picture, you can see an animal that is quite representative of wild animals. So when many people think of wild animals, they probably think of animals like lions or elephants, maybe giraffes. They typically think of vertebrates and they typically think of animals that um, are adults. So what's interesting though, is that most animals reproduce by having very large numbers of aspirin um, and the majority of them don't, don't make it to maturity. Otherwise, their population would, um, you know, grow exponentially in, in a very uh, short amount of time. So the typical animal is like this one you've seen here. Uh, it's, it's an animal that is just uh, getting out of, of her egg. And uh, the vast majority of these animals will die, and many of them shortly after coming into existence. And uh, their deaths may be very painful. And because they 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 die uh, so uh, early, they don't have time enough to have positive experiences that might maybe compensate something for for that. Um, meaning that many animals have lives where suffering may be um, prevalent. And as we can see in this picture, I think that it is you know it's very unlikely that these animals aren't really sentient. Uh, so if we consider all this. We can see how all the efforts that I mentioned before to help wild animals really look like necessary ones, but also that we should make an effort also to try to increase the amount of work that we are putting in here. At this point, the organizations working on this, um, that are, um, as far as I know, only three organizations, which are animal ethics, that uh, the we've done some research Basically, our goal now is to work on wild animal suffering outreach. Then there is Wild Animal Initiative, which works mainly in promoting and doing research, trying to further interest uh, about this topic in, in uh, academia. And then Rethink Priorities, uh, an organization you may know already about, and um, that is not just focused on animals, they work on a bunch of different things but they have also been doing some, some research on, on, on this topic. So we coordinate our efforts. So uh, each of us uh, tackles one of the, of, of the sides of the, of the problem. So um, right now, these three organizations, we are uh, working on different areas in this, in this field, but basically, as I said before, there are certain priorities here. One is to build this academic field that will allow us uh, will allow us in the future to um, make much more progress about this. Second one is to get more um, EAs and animal advocates and people sympathetic to this among you know wider audiences to care about wild animals to know about the issue of, of wild animal suffering. So if any of you really is interested about this, uh, there are different ways in which uh, work can be done on this and in which uh, 
it's possible to collaborate. So finally, um, in the last um, part of the presentation, I want to address issues that have to do with uh, what we may expect the future to be. We need to do much more research about this and to examine potential crucial considerations that we are missing there. But basically there is one idea here, and I assume you are kind of, you are already familiar or kind of at least with long-termism um, and with the general argument for it that, you know, because the far future will be uh, so long, it, it will act, actually contain many more sentient beings than the present or, or the near future will. And actually it's possible that the vast majority of the sentient beings that will ever exist will be in the, in the future rather than in the past. So um, this, as I said, it, it's not just the case for humans or their descendants, it's also the case for non-human animals. But what happens is that work on long-termism has tended to focus exclusively on either humans or maybe post-humans that's descending from, from humans. So um, this makes sense if we think that in the future, um, humans are not really going to continue to breed non-human animals and if humans will maybe spread through, through around the universe, but not non-human animals. But nevertheless, there are many considerations here that may be um, you know, problematic and that we should take into, into account. So there are some risks that animal exploitation will be expanded. I mean, we can perfectly think that if uh, humans end up colonizing other places, they could bring non-human animals with them. Humans can also create new forms of animal lives. And eventually there is also the issue about uh, humans creating uh, non-human uh, new forms of sentience, even if these uh, forms of sentience are not uh, animals. So concerning this, something that's interesting is that while we are all very familiar with factory farming, we can think of what happened uh, like for instance, a hundred years ago, when there was already a movement and previous to that, like in the end of the 19th century, there was already a movement defending non-human animals. You can see here a picture of a protest against animal experimentation. What's interesting is that at that point, uh, for instance, if you think, yeah, late 19th century or uh, early 20th century, well, industrialization was, you know, uh, something that everyone was familiar with. And everyone was also familiar with the fact that people were using animals, they were exploiting animals. But animals defenders at that time, they didn't make the connection and they didn't predict that in the future, industrialization would expand also to cover animal exploitation. So they didn't predict factory farming. Um, however, we now in the situation in which we are, uh, well, we may think, well, you know, these people, how, how they could be so blind? We may be, you know, making the same mistakes in not predicting um, things that can happen to, to non-human animals in the, in the future. And well, I just mentioned animal exploitation, but something similar could happen also in the case of wild animal suffering. So there is actually a risk of humans either um, by accident or voluntarily, we'll end up um, you know, bringing invertebrates uh, to space, to other places. Or they may even bring other organisms that may eventually evolve in a certain place and in the appropriate ecosystem or the appropriate environment and end up being sentient. This also is the rationale um, behind efforts to spread life through panspermia. Uh, and this is not really such a crazy idea. There has been some academic discussion about this. Um, it's not the kind of thing that I would mention in a talk for the general public, but I think you may, you, you may want to discuss this maybe later. So there are actually ways, even if they may sound a bit too crazy or speculative, in which we could increase wild animal suffering in the future. So having said this, uh, and just to conclude, if you want more information, well, this is, um, yeah, uh, 
snapshot of our website where there, are, you know, all the things that I mentioned, well, you can find much more information about each of these topics uh, there, or you can check out this uh, YouTube channel where among other things, you can find videos about uh, the importance of the future and wild animal suffering. And then we also have this ebook that you can download. It's probably one of the most comprehensive ones about uh, wild animal suffering. And yeah, that would be pretty much it. So